Uh, hi, so uh, my first name is tricky to pronounce. Feel free to call me Para. Everyone's called me Para from when I was born. Um, so I graduated from the U uh, three years ago. Uh, I did a lot of machine learning when I was in when I was in grad school. Uh, I was I was focused on a lot of theoretical aspects of machine learning, trying to bring geometry uh, into machine learning. After all, what you want in machine learning is to be able to compare things and put th things that are similar to each other together to identify a pattern, and geometry becomes very crucial when you want to put similar things together. And I was focused on a lot of geometry. Quickly turned out uh, you can't write theorems in, in, in the industry. You need to get things done. Uh, so um, starting to look at uh, what applied areas I can uh, use my machine learning expertise on. I went to California. I was at Yahoo for a year, year and a half. I was doing some ad analytics for them. Uh, wasn't really what I wanted to do. And uh, I had an opportunity to come back to Salt Lake and uh, work for ESP Networks. I was talking to Paul, he's our CEO. Uh, and uh, at that time, there were four people. It seemed like a really cool group to work with. And uh, I've been with them for a year and a half now. And uh, uh, we have been out of stealth for maybe close to seven or eight months. Uh, and uh, we want to look at uh, network flow data. And uh, we want to see if we can figure out if uh, our customers have been breached as soon as possible. We are not an endpoint solution. We are. We look at uh, network flow data. We collect a ridiculous amount of uh, metadata from the network. Uh, the installation itself is pretty simple. We have a uh, we have a switch that sits in your network, mirrors the traffic, sends the data to mm -hmm. our cloud. We do all the processing on the cloud. Uh, tons of advantages that way. Shared cost. We can look at. We can. We can run our machine learning models on other customers, transfer the learning over to uh, customers in a similar domain, uh, cheaper that way. Uh, the, s the switch itself is pretty cheap on the, on the consumer side. Um, so this is going to be the only plug for the company, this slide. Everything else is meant to be uh, a zero to machine learning kind of um, discussion. That's good, because I was going to you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, b before I did that, I wanted to quickly go around and see uh, uh, you know, what you guys are interested in, what you want from the talk. Uh, I certainly don't want this to be a one-way presentation. Uh, it'll be great if this is a discussion. Um, so yeah, if you can quickly go around, what is your expertise in machine learning, and what do you other ways do? I've done a little bit of uh, artificial intelligence work. I'm a software engineer, and I just want to learn how machines learn. Okay. Yeah, I have very little experience, so I'm just hoping to start learning. Okay. Student, same. I uh, just good intro. I like to hear what you say. Nothing whatsoever. I'm just here. <laughs> okay. Same as him. Perfect. <laughs> same for me too. Go cool. this time. <laughs> I just I just want to um, see if I can manipulate a, a computer into falling for a Nigerian prince scam. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> That's why I'm here. I've been doing that for a long time, my friend. <laughs> Artificial intelligence, you know, they, they're not truly human until they... they it, it's interesting that I, I get these scam emails not to my uh, personal account, but to my CS account at the U. And it's weird. I'm like, find your right target audience, not computer science people at the university. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just kind of hoping that it's a general overview, I guess, basically, like from, um, you know, 101 style stuff. It seems like every time you turn around, people are just like, oh, machine learning. Oh, machine learning will solve all the things. <laughs> Don't worry. We've got machine learning. And it's just like, okay, well, what does that mean? Like, what does it actually do? Right. What separates that from actual AI? And right. So, uh, I guess the best description is I'm that fucking Linux guy. 
Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, that, that basically covers my machine learning knowledge as well, more or less, uh, which is to say I really don't have any. Um, but, you know, I, if you gave me 15 minutes to talk to the right people, I could fake it. Okay. Um, I don't particularly have any <coughs> machine learning experience, but I have a lot of information security experience. And okay. I'm interested in just kind of understanding you know, how machine learning can help uh, make it possible for us to find the right needle in the stack of needles. Right. I have, for me it's other way, I have very little uh, security experience. I've, all my experiences in machine learning and uh, it's, it's very similar at a company to everyone else except me have decades of uh, security experience. And we talk every day for a couple of hours. I just want to keep the robots from winning. All right. <laughs> Good luck with that. Woo robots! You're listening. <laughs> I was always oh, I'm just here because the cool kids are. All right. And where would they be? Hello. Oh. Okay. <laughs> no, you, you got me there. Um, I just have a lot of curiosities. Uh, I'm more in software engineering, but um, I'm curious about anything that comes to technology. Okay. Nice to meet you. From the security and figuring out how uh, all this stuff works. So, it seemed, seemed interesting. Check it out. So. I'm just a continuous learner, not like math. Okay. <laughs> I, I try to stay away from math from the slides. I, I try hard to put a lot of pictures in. Uh, but I, I'm guessing that's good today. Uh, but anyway, so I, I really like this line because uh, there's a, a lot of machine learning competitions out there uh, <coughs> been running for 15, 20 years. Uh, KDD Cup, uh, Kaggle Challenges. You see a lot of people trying to uh, not come up with a new algorithm to, to you know, get maximum efficiency or accuracy. Um, most of these competitions is not about runtime, it's about uh, how accurate you are in trying to classify the good versus bad or if it's a, uh, throwing your balls into multiple bins, uh, finding the right bin to throw in and your final accuracy of how, did, how good you did. You'd see that most of the people who win at the top three, they do not write the smartest algorithm. It's about trying to find the right representation for the data. You, your data is in the raw format. You can, it might be uh, not <coughs> all uh, numeric. If, I, if you had height and weight of kids in a class and you want to find a pattern, maybe it's very easy. But um, data comes in different formats. If you, have, if you want to find faces in an image, for example, you, have, uh, you, could, you could take a JPEG image. You could pass that to a convolution filter. You could transform it into uh, a vector uh, of, of, of floating points. Uh, or maybe you do something else to it, it, it becomes better. Uh, there is this popular algorithm called uh, SIFT, S-I-F-T, which has uh, been super popular for about 15, 20 years. Uh, although this paper that was written never got into any of the uh, peer-reviewed journals for 10 years or so. People thought it was trash because they couldn't understand it. But it turns out it's super nice in trying to identify objects inside uh, images. So a lot of times it's about how you present the data, how you represent the data uh, when you run your machine learning algorithm. So it's often not the smartest algorithms that win, it's how much data you have and uh, how well you can represent it, represent it. Because in the end of the day, you want to find things that are similar uh, and put them in the same bag. And if you cannot represent them the right way, then you cannot uh, possibly put similar things together. So uh, I would, so, Machine learning branch of engineering that uh, develops an automated inter in inference in some sense. So you want to uh, maybe find a recommender, you want to build a recommender system uh, that tells you, oh, I bought this, what else should I buy? Amazon would like it, um, Netflix would like it. Or maybe you want to find uh, Nigerian prince emails from uh, the, the right ones. Uh, or you want to find the actual Nigerian prince from a group of fake Nigerian princes, and uh, 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 and and the task is to see if you can pick out these uh, sharp needles in some sense, or uh, you could have uh, uh, brain scans, and you want to figure out if there is a early onset of uh, Alzheimer's. So 
there's a tons of there, there are tons of uh, different applications for machine learning. Uh, how effective they are depends on again how uh, effectively the data data is presented uh, and uh, and uh, is is the is the problem really uh, suitable? Uh, yeah. When you say how effectively the data is presented, do you mean presented to us, the people, or to the computers? To the to the computers. Okay. So. Uh, I mean, in essence, if, if we cannot distinguish it, it's very hard for the computers to distinguish it. That's a very vague statement. Uh, it, it, it's not always true, but uh, in general, there, there are two wide classifications of learning algorithms. Uh, one is uh, supervised learning, the other is unsupervised. In the case of supervised learning, which is in general more effective type of learning algorithms, you have an uh, expert try and tag the uh, uh, data as good or bad. You know, you have the early problems of machine learning where I have email and I have tons of spam. 20 years ago, there were way more spam than what it is now. And the, 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 one of the main reasons why the spam is reduced uh, now is not because there are smarter algorithms. It's because humans often annotate things saying this is spam and this is not. And that is a feedback to the learning algorithms in trying to uh, retrain the, uh, the model as to what really uh, is a spam email and what is not. So that's the optimization. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, so I was just looking at this chart. I missed. Oh, so uh, you know, it, it, in general, learning is a, is a you know, it's it's a combination of different things. Uh, op <laughs> optimization from a from a math standpoint, uh, because a lot of machine learning algorithms uh, uh, generally are are expressed as a form of optimization uh, uh, formulation. So there's a there's a lot of statistics in it, uh, algorithms and. What is common amongst these is uh, you want to identify the underlying structure inside the data. Yeah. Most, uh, so d data has structure, data has a pattern, and in general, the l learning that you want to do is to be able to identify these structures or patterns, and you know, geometry becomes crucial. So uh, I don't know how many of these terms you're familiar with. Um, uh, so you'd find that some of the things are, um, that I have here, some of the examples that I have here are related to uh, text data. Uh, the reason for that is a lot of data that we get, uh, we collect, uh, is, is text, it's not numeric. So, uh, for example, uh, under representation, uh, you know, TF-IDF is a, is, a, is a popular way to construct a representation out of uh, document data. And, uh, and uh, word to work is uh, another newer algorithm developed at Google uh, it is a uh, it's it's a much more effective way to identify or understand the semantics uh, of the of the words present inside the uh, inside a, inside a document. Um, it's 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 been much more effective in classifying documents into uh, the right categories. Uh, the reason you have I have these examples is because the data that we use again is 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 text. It's not it's not numeric. Um, the, there are tons of other uh, ways to represent data depending on what kind of uh, data, that, data that you have. You could have images, you could have brain scans, you could have, uh, it could be a uh, geo engineer collecting tons of uh, numeric data about um, the weather. The representation would again differ based on uh, what you have. Uh, what I have here in specific is when you have text related data. And uh, Features in general, when people talk about features in machine learning, they talk about different um, attributes that they can collect about uh, a particular uh, composite data. Uh, for us, we have, for example, IP addresses, uh, port protocol, um, and tons of other um, en enriched applications that you enriched fields that we collect or that we um, uh, collect from various different sources, and each of them is a feature. And you would People sometimes <coughs> use different words for it. Uh, you you can you can see people calling it multivariate data because it's in multiple uh, dimensions. Uh, dimensions is again another term. Feels um, very database-ish term. Um, and in general, what you want to do is to be able to identify different homogeneous, uh, cohesive groups uh, or clusters inside the data. And in general, that becomes your task of final goal in machine learning. And the way you formulate the problem becomes can I identify uh, cohesive groups? Can I identify cohesive uh, structures, cohesive clusters inside the data? 
and uh, you'll also see a lot of uh, uh, feature selection or dimensionality reduction uh, being talk, being thrown about when you when people talk about machine learning, and uh, what feature selection uh, means in one line is to be able to when you're presented with four thousand dimensions in, in in our case, for example, not all four thousand dimensions uh, are relevant towards the final task. If my task is to find out uh, bad packets transmitting across the network, uh, maybe time of the day is not really relevant because the attacker could attack uh, you know could be uh, on the network uh, any point of time. Maybe that's not very relevant. And if that is one of the features uh, that we use, uh, the more features you have in general, the better. But the more features that you have that are not uh, relevant to the f task at hand, uh, it, it, it makes all the data look very similar, which becomes very hard to pick out the sharp needles. So uh, a lot of cases, uh, the pre-processing steps uh, for machine learning is uh, to pick out the relevant features, pick out the right features, uh, to reduce your dimensions from how many ever thousands of uh, dimensions that you have to a reasonable number that uh, makes the learning task much more effective. And uh, the two uh, general branches of machine learning uh, you know, are supervised and un unsupervised. In the case of supervised, you have some uh, domain expert trying to label uh, a bunch of examples as uh, you know uh, good or bad um, and let's 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 stick to, to the email example it's often called uh, spam or ham ham being the nice emails and spam is the not so nice emails and it's very easy for a human to uh, yeah, label the email as uh, ham or spam we, we see emails every day we write tens of thousands of them we get tens of thousands of them and uh, we know what an email uh, looks like when it's um, when it's spam, it doesn't have to say the words of Viagra or 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 uh, Nigerian Prince giving uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, dollars to us. We know a uh, spam email when when we see one. Uh, people still click on the links. People still click on the links. Yeah. In, in in the slightest chance that maybe you get you get a million dollars, but um, <laughs> pure curiosity. But but we know we know we know a spam email when we see one, or at least uh, a good number of us know a spam email when we see one. So uh, in, in in cases of supervised learning, you have these uh, domain experts in this case, common people, uh, tag emails as good good or bad, and the task then becomes: Can I then uh, tag other unlabeled emails as good or bad? Because I cannot keep doing this uh, every single email that comes in. I want uh, Google or Yahoo or uh, any other email service provider to be able to do this for me automatically. And uh, the task then for uh, the email service provider is to see if they can, uh, using the tags that are already present, uh, find things that are similar and, 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 uh, and you know, put them in the relevant, relevant groups. So let me take a quick step back. Um, I know a couple of you guys wanted to talk about, you know, uh, why machine learning, what can I do? Uh, when did it branch off from artificial intelligence? So I think in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of interest in AI. There was a lot of interest in um, um, motion planning, path planning for robots. Uh, people wanted to see if robots can do uh, tons of things. Can it walk? Can it play soccer? Uh, there's still uh, a RoboCup that is very popular. Um, and it's it's it's. It's a huge uh, prestige for uh, the team that wins a RoboCup, even though they don't get tons of money from it, but they have to spend lots of money on building these robots every single, every single time. Uh, so the, the 80s and 90s kind of uh, euphoria was around, can we, can we mimic life? Can we build uh, agents that can, that can think like humans, that can act like humans? And uh, I think it fell apart for two reasons. One. It was a very vague and very ambitious goal. It was it was, it was very ill-defined. Uh, you know, the the problem uh, wasn't well formulated. Uh, so there was a there was a shooting for the stars kind of thing. The second reason is we didn't have the kind of processing power uh, that we have today. Uh, we in the nineties there was a lot of interest in uh, deep neural networks. Uh, people wanted to see if uh, we can we can um, build machine learning models. Uh, the way our brains uh, interpret things can we build an array of neurons in trying to process each uh, each feature or dimension in the data that we see, and then 
know, when we make a decision, we make a decision based on multiple things. We we maybe uh, we want to eat something. We we have smell, taste. We have different senses, and we make a decision which is a which is a complex uh, uh, take on all the different things that we can perceive. And uh, neural networks, in some sense, was a was a way to uh, was a bad attempt at that. In some sense, but the problem with neural networks is it it is incredibly slow. It required tremendous amounts of processing power. It just could not be done on a, on your uh, desktop. So the interest kind of weaned away towards the late nineties. People were kind of iffy about artificial intelligence because it, it was a promise that never uh, uh, happened. So people took a step back and said, okay, you know what? This is too ill-defined. Let's define, let's, let's do defined, uh, let's attack defined problems. Um, you obviously had to rebrand a little bit. Uh, machine learning became the go-to term for me, I think, after that. Uh, you, you, you didn't want to have a failed brand name. Uh, to uh, go back to, uh, which is again the case with uh, neural networks. There's a lot of deep learning uh, algorithms that, that are being talked about these days. Deep learning is just a newer brand name for uh, neural networks which failed in the 90s. The reason why deep learning is so powerful now is because you have GPUs on machines uh, that can uh, solve neural networks uh, without any problem. So in some sense this is the, this is my take on what was, what happened from the 80s till now. Uh, with so AI and uh, to machine learning. Are you still using neural networks with the machine learning, or is it different from the standard model? Uh, so we are trying to. Mm -hmm. uh, we are trying to run some uh, deep, neural so deep you're, learning you're networks. So you're still using a neural network when you're doing machine learning. Correct. It's just and a different term for the. Correct. And, and neural, uh, neural networks or deep learning is a type of machine learning algorithm, mm -hmm. uh, except you know, back in the 90s it was just. Uh, not achievable on a on a on a single machine. Mm -hmm. um, we can do that now. Okay. Yeah. And um, uh, I think machine learning has become a much more strongly used word uh, since the two thousands. Uh, so uh, when people talked about neural networks in the nineties, they used neural networks as a type of artificial intelligence algorithm. Now it's a it's a so in general, artificial intelligence and machine learning are very interchangeable words, uh, but Machine learning is definitely a smaller subset of what the AI goal was. You know, AI has a much larger um, end goal. Um, you, you want path planning for robots to um, Amazon delivering you mail to driverless cars. And um, machine learning is definitely a smaller subset, but um, much more well-defined set of problems and um, specific and direct applications. So uh, this differs from people to people. Uh, for me, this is a process pipeline. Um, in general, irrespective of what your what your uh, goal is, I think uh, a learning algorithm you should you should not jump into running machine learning algorithms without having the right question. You want to be able to have the question very crisp and very precise. And uh, um, like I want, I have emails and I want to classify them as hammer span. And um, then you know, get the data, look at the data, see if you can, as a human, trying to distinguish between uh, the data. Can you find the sharp needles uh, if that's what you want to find, or maybe you, I want to find, I want to categorize them into multiple different groups. Um, I have a bunch of documents. Maybe I want to uh, news, newspaper articles. I want to categorize them into sports, politics, and so on. So in this case, there are multiple buckets. It's not just picking out the sharp needles. Uh, so, in general, with the exploration of data, is uh, you want to be able to see if you can uh, visualize the data. In in case of text, it's human readable. If it's not, and you have uh, you're in a lab and you collect uh, various uh, uh, data points about uh, your, your you know that goes on in your experiment, uh, maybe it's in multiple dimensions. You cannot quite visualize it. You cannot see the structures that are present inside the data. But can you still do anything that you can to uh, try and put them in these different uh, um, clusters or bags that uh, you want them to. Uh, it's okay if you, if you don't have the luxury uh, or if you don't have the exper expertise to do it, but if you can, then that helps out the learning algorithms in general uh, quite a bit. And uh, like I talked before, you want to be able to prune or throw away uh, features that are irre irrelevant to the final task at hand. 
uh, it might not be relevant to uh, another task. Uh, let's say you want you want two different. Um, let's say I have pic uh, pictures on the internet, and I want to be able to uh, categorize them. I could categorize them as the types of things that are present inside each picture, or maybe I'm really silly. I want all the red bags, red pictures to go in one bag, the blue to go in one bag, and so on. And these are, let's call the first, uh, let's call the first um, clustering in some sense. Uh, partition one, let's call the second clustering partition two. You'd expect these two clusterings or partitions to be very different from each other. And uh, and that goes back to the question, you know, it, it all depends on uh, what you want to do uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a task uh, for machine learning to uh, help you. And um, in some sense, uh, feature selection <coughs> is geared towards, towards the task. Uh, you want to be able to pick the right um, features, pick the right relevant dimensions that are relevant to the task at hand and therefore help the machine learning algorithm to be able to uh, be successful. Uh, and then and the, the next immediate step is to be able to pick a similarity measure. Um, in general, you want to be able to, again, it uh, goes back to a uh, lot of machine learning has to deal with putting similar things together. and. You want to put similar things together, which means that you have this notion of an underlying similarity score. You, you, you want to be able to say how similar one data item is to another and, uh, and, and have a metric on them. In general, nice metrics are, are normalized. They, have, uh, they lie between 0 and 1, uh, easy for humans to interpret. Um, you want to be able to have this uh, nice metric to be able to then have a learning task go on and say, hey, these two objects are similar to an extent of 0.9, so I, I'm going to put them together. Uh, these two are 0 0.1, so I'm, trying, I'm going to try not to put them together. And then pick and uh, run a learning task. And uh, there are a variety of machine learning algorithms for different kinds of tasks. Uh, there are a whole bunch of cheat sheets that are available um, from Microsoft and, uh, and, and a whole bunch of other um, other big players that are uh, that run a lot of machine learning. So uh, if if you have a question at hand, um, once you're done feature selection, you, these cheat sheets are fantastic. Uh, you can go look at uh, what people have done for similar tasks and uh, pick and choose a number of algorithms and try to run them uh, one after other. See how well they perform. And a lot of times, this is where people get stuck uh, because. Uh, Till now, it's 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 almost easy. Lot of uh, lot of the task till now is not machine learning. Uh, you've done this every day. You've 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 cleaned your data. You've um, you've run tons of different algorithms on them. Uh, so till till that point, uh, where you pick a similarity measure, it's not really um, it's not really machine learning. So it's something that you have, that you, you have been doing for a while, uh, hopefully, and it's. The struggle really starts when you run a learning task. Uh, the struggle is twofold. One is uh, being able to interpret the results of machine learning. Uh, if you knew what the uh, what the clusters are going to be, what the groups are going to be, uh, then it becomes a little easier. In the case of uh, I have images and I want them to, I want each uh, bag to have a homogeneous group of pictures. So I want maybe all the landscapes to go in one one bag, I want all the uh, mountains to go in other, all the people to go in other, and so on, then I know what the bags look like. So there is there's a way to evaluate or interpret the results of the learning algorithm. The learning algorithm is going to tag each picture with, uh, with the right uh, you know, uh, cluster number or, or the right, right bag. But what if it was, um, uh, uh, some other kinds of data where you don't you don't have the luxury to know what the what the final bags look like, uh, and that's the common case. Uh, the cases where you don't have so, uh, uh, for example, we, when I was in grad school, I was working with uh, uh, with uh, the geosciences uh, uh, department, and they collect a ridiculous number of uh, data points uh, for uh, um, earthquakes. And it's very hard to know what the final goal is. And uh, for them, it was, uh, we have tons of these data. It's very hard for human to find patterns. Can machine learning find interesting patterns? Uh, and, and 
And in that case, I don't know what the final um, bags are going to look like. If I want to cluster them into different groups, I don't know what, she, what each group is going to mean. So it becomes very hard for uh, a machine learning practitioner or even a, even a domain expert uh, who has looked at the data for many, many years to be able to interpret the results or validate them. And th that's a crucial bottleneck. And the second difficulty is, is the inherently with the learning algorithm itself. A lot of al learning algorithms, um, they perform well um, with, with one kind of data. They do not quite do the same with other kinds of data. So you'd expect that, for example, k-means is a very, very popular uh, clustering algorithm. People run k-means all the time. Uh, but uh, k-means really sucks when you run it on uh, text data. So, but it, it's, it's great when you run, run, run k-means on image data and trying to cluster them into different categories. So the other struggle is, I know k-means is popular. Why is it not working for me? Uh, and, and, and there are a few uh, tricks there. Most of these learning algorithms, they have a number of parameters. They have various knobs that you can turn and uh, adjust. So there's a lot of, can I uh, modify a few uh, knobs? Can I, can I rerun the clustering algorithm on them? Can I reinterpret it? So this cycle goes on for a long time until one day you say, hey, this is amazing. I'm very happy with the results. I know I'm going to get my million dollars from the Nigerian prince. But uh, this, otherwise, this this goes in a loop for a while, and then, hopefully, hopefully, if you're not in academia and if you are um, uh, like me, uh, trying to uh, win multiple clients, you better be able to visualize the data. Um, if you if you cannot provide a sexy dashboard, I think it becomes very difficult for <coughs> customers to be uh, impressed upon. So this becomes very crucial. Uh, tons of people can do really cool uh, visualization. Lots of uh, Lots of uh, uh, JavaScript stuff out there, which uh, does uh, tremendous, tremendously cool visualization. And uh, the, the trick, though, is to you have data which is in multiple dimensions, and you want to be able to show them in two, 2D, hopefully. Uh, 3D becomes tricky, yeah, even. And anything more, you cannot do it. So the trick is to see if you can squash the data from multiple dimensions to a lower dimensional space where you can then visualize them. So this, I mean, this process is, is basically taking something we already know and it, getting the computer, you know, the machine to, to replicate our knowledge, right? Uh, I mean, I broadly speaking, yes. What I'm getting to is, is at what point, I mean, can you get it to a point where it starts making its own? I mean, things are, are subjective or, or, or not as, as you know, clearly defined in, you know, in, in buckets or, or, you know, however you want to define that. Um, right. Like for example, a, a network attack, right? Um, whereas you know, where you have some traffic that's good, some traffic that's bad, right? Some traffic that's, you know, kind of in between, right? And some traffic that, you know, you just don't know where it goes. Right. And if and if you train on known good traffic and train on known bad traffic, right. Is it able to interpret, you know, future conditions that don't fall into either category? I mean, I, I, I mean, how do you get to that point from here? Uh, it's it's hard. Uh, it's definitely hard. Uh, it's it's. Uh, if you don't know beforehand what is bad, correct. So the the, the 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 at least with information security, a lot of what is necessary is can I find the unknown unknowns? Uh, it's very easy to find the known unknowns. Uh, yeah. People have been doing this for decades. Uh, you could write, you know, rules engine were popular. You could write a bunch of rules saying if 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 I have a scan on a particular port, very simple rule, I'm going to flag this as a as suspicious. <laughs> um, a lot of what uh, machine learning is sought after for is can I pick the unknown at once? And I don't know the answer to that yet. Okay, so another question is is can you get a, a well, you've got a similarity measure. Is it is that something that's, um, uh, I mean, that is a, is a, like a yes or no, or is it something where you can you know, have a, a range of values that are? Correct, uh, usually a range of values. Uh, if, if all you can do is a binary yes or no, um, so there there is a there is a uh, branch of machine learning algorithms that does uh, uh, binary uh, yes or no kind of thing, uh, where all all you can do is um, I'm going to crowdsource my uh, my decision making because I have let's say I have no <coughs> idea what similarity measure to use. I'm going to show you 
uh, I'm going to do a mechanical Turk. I'm going to show you two um, two instances. I'm going to ask you to see, say if they're similar or not. That that is all you can do because you don't, as a user, I don't expect you to understand a range of uh, values. So uh, all I want you to do is, should they be similar? Should they be in the same bag or not? And I and that's all I can hope to collect. I can ho only hope to collect zeros and ones. Uh, if that's the worst that you can do, if that's the best you can do, then yes, that's what we have to deal with. But otherwise, in general, uh, the, the the similarity measure or a distance metric, they're mutually, uh, yeah, a distance metric is the opposite of a similarity measure. A distance metric tells you how different two uh, instances are. A similarity measure tells you how similar two instances are. Uh, they they lie in a range. Um, okay, so say if you had, say you had like a list of, of weak passwords, you know, and there's a lot of things that constitute a weak password. It could be right. the, the to the length, it could be just all lowercase short par uh, password. Right. Right. It could be something that's a known bad password, right. uh, common password, and then you've got a list of, of strong passwords. Sure. That you know, various criteria that determine that. Right. And you feed the you know you, you train on those two sets. Right. Can it determine a score of how strong a password is based on that? Yes, correct. So uh, given this is this is you know a seventy percent strong password. Correct. That's a, that's a very reasonable uh, application. And uh, again, the effective of effectiveness of how good I can determine that will depend on uh, w whether or not I can have the right similarity measure and uh, whether or not I can have the right representation. For example, a lot of times a weak password has a, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, uh, entropy as a information theoretic uh, sense. Uh, if, uh, so e entropy is a common way to capture how much information I, 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 I'm leaking out. So. Uh, if instead of just the string of uh, as a password, if I can provide entropy and other things along with it, and then build the right similarity measure, then I I, I could possibly hope for better uh, classification accuracy. But yes, that is definitely a very uh, very in my mind uh, doable application um, for machine learning. Okay. Oh, this is great. I, I don't again I don't want this to be a lecture. I want I want more questions. If you don't get to 64 slides, if you had 20 slides, I'm more than happy, actually. Now, uh, how balanced does your data have to be when you talk about rep uh, representation? That's a very good question. <laughs> the, the, the largest problem, I think, for information security is that we have a classic case of not having the right balance. And so by balance, I mean, <coughs> I, I, or, or if, I, if we balance, what you mean is you have, uh, you have, I have two classes here. I have the good. Um, packets and I have the bad packets. Uh, uh, the balance between the good and pack bad packets is, is, is it's not good at all. You have you don't expect to have uh, a fourth or even a third or even a fourth of all the traffic to be uh, to be bad. You you, you expect much much uh, um, exponentially lower quantities of packets to be bad, and uh, and that's really the problem uh, in, with machine learning in general. A lot of machine learning algorithms fail if the the balance between the classes uh, is is terrible. If you have a uh, lot of data that is good and two data items that are bad, your learning algorithm is not really going to spot that. Uh, so the trick then is to not be able to find uh, distinguish between two classes. It's to be able to see if I can uh, do what is called an outlier detection or an anomaly detection, where you want to find. You you assume that all the things are uh, cohesive and uh, they they uh, they are one category they belong to one category and you want to find things that are far away from this category, and so there are ways to deal around uh, the the problem of having a class imbalance, but uh, class imbalance is definitely a, um, a a huge problem. And if you know in some sense an uh, easy way to get around that is if you know how much the balance is off. Let's say I have for every thousand good uh, packets, I know that there's one bad packet. Uh, I can weigh the uh, data items accordingly. Uh, so I treat the good packets, uh, uh, I give a much lower weight to the good packets so they don't quite dominate and uh, you can't see the sharp needle in, in that case. So, but it's, it, is, it is a problem that a lot of people address and acknowledge. Any more questions? So, uh, we are good at this. We know this is a dog and this is a girl. Why do you have to the same picture? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not then. <laughs> <laughs>
So, uh, we, we, we have, a, we, as humans, we, we are good at spotting uh, differences. We, you know, uh, we are good at finding why things are similar or dissimilar if they are represented in the right format. Uh, with pictures, it becomes easier. Again, like I said, you have, let's say you have weather data. It's going to be super ridiculous to be able to uh, visualize them. And therefore, it's going to be hard to pick out uh, things that are different and, or not. But in the cases that humans are able to identify uh, if one uh, instance should, should go to a particular category or not, uh, and you have the luxury to do it, then always do it. Always see if people can figure out uh, if a similarity measure that you picked is the right similarity measure. Um, and, and this becomes the, uh, this is the, f this is the f crucial, most crucial artifact in trying to uh, run any machine learning algorithm. If your, if your similarity measure is screwed up, if your, comp if your similarity measure comes back and says, uh, two objects are really similar, where in fact they're super dissimilar, you could have the best machine learning uh, algorithm running, it's going to do crappy. Uh, all right, so uh, I don't know if you guys are similar, or you, you guys are uh, familiar with, uh, with uh, vector space models. Uh, uh, in general, let's say, keep this very simple. Let's say you have uh, two dimensions. Um, a lot of times, um, text data is, um, is, is transformed and represented as, as vectors in uh, multiple uh, dimensions. Let's say for purposes of uh, simplicity, we have uh, two dimensions and we have, let's say, two data points. One of the, uh, one of the uh, similarity measures uh, is, uh, which is popular is, is uh, what is called a cosine similarity. And uh, all that it does is compute the dot product between the two vectors, uh, basic algebra, and then um, divide the dot product by the uh, magnitude of the vectors. And that gives you the, cause of the angle between them, and that tells you how similar things are. If the, if the, if the two vectors are the same, uh, cause zero is one, they're very similar. If they're completely in the opposite direction, uh, it's zero, and so on. So cause of the angle between the vectors kind of tells you how similar uh, things are, and it's one very popular way to capture how similar uh, two data items are. And if I can, again, if I can represent my data as vectors, then I can do this. Um, representing the data in the vector space is not always, maybe not always is the right thing to do. Uh, so uh, step one before this, actually step zero then, uh, is to uh, have the right representation for the data. If I have text data, the popular belief right now is that you can represent them in, a, in, in, a, in this vector space, not necessarily two dimensions, but a multiple, uh, multi-dimensional vector space, in which case I can compute the cost of the angle subtended between them, which tells me how similar they are, and uh, hopefully I can classify similar things together. Maybe I can use this for automatic uh, translation from multiple languages, uh, applications, and numerous. Uh, another another uh, similarity measure, or actually a distance metric, is what is called a Euclidean distance. Uh, very, you, you guys should be very familiar with Euclidean instances. That's all we play with in, in high school uh, uh, algebra and geometry. Uh, you have two vectors, and you want to find the distance between P and Q. Um, uh, and uh, you know it's square root of the distance between the uh, differences between the, the coordinate values. And this is, again, another possible uh, similarity measure. I know it's a distance, but in general, a similarity measure is derived as a one minus distance kind of thing, and uh, they are interchangeably used distances and similarity measures. Some algorithms take distance metric distances as an input. Some algorithms take similarities as an input. So it doesn't matter which uh, you you come up with. They are very interchangeable. Again, um, the data is again in, in, in a, in a two-dimensional space, uh, but again, there are different ways to compare them. Uh, a Euclidean distance might give you a different score from what the, uh, what the cosine uh, similarity gives you. Uh, it all depends on you as a user uh, who knows the data. It, it, uh, you're the domain expert. It's up to you to figure out what the right uh, similarity measure is. It's, it's a tricky thing to do. Uh, often it's, again, by trial and error. Uh, you run, run this through multiple known similarity measures. 
see which one works the best. There's no, it's, there's no real science to it. it, it it's really a, an art when it comes to different applied areas. So this should really have been before um, similarities. Step zero is really to have the right representation for the data. And uh, with, with text data, for example, uh, TF, IDF, short for term frequency, inverse document frequency, is a very popular way to take the text data and uh, transform them or convert them or represent them in a vector space model on which you can then do math on. That's the final goal for any machine learning algorithm. Uh, you want to be able to do math on, on the data. If the data is not inherently uh, um, in a way that you can run math on, you have to be able to uh, be able to transform them or convert them in a, in a, in a, in a format where you can represent them in a, in a space where you can then compute how similar things are. Um, if you have two documents, we as humans know if they're similar or not. It's very hard for us to give a number that tells how similar two documents are, but uh, like in the case of binary uh, yes or no kind of answer where two, two documents are similar, uh, we are reasonably good at that. Uh, we can categorize, and provided maybe we are told of what categories the documents belong to. Uh, for example, yeah. Because how, how do you get around the issue of you have a lot of objects, not having to compare every single object with every single other object? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, the because it seems like that would give you certain answers that you couldn't otherwise get if you if you didn't do that. Can you can you elaborate? Yeah. Well, it seems like uh, just the relationship between. If you if you had just two or three objects, you were comparing another million objects together. Right. You, you might not find relationships between two other objects. You know, and they, they may have some similarities that are not within the few objects you're comparing to. So you would miss certain similarities if if, if your the objects you're using for comparison don't capture all possibilities. Uh, correct. So. The, 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 the goal is to see, so in general, there are, uh, there are two different types of uh, errors or uh, misclassification scores when it comes to learning algorithms. One is called a training error, and the other is called a test error. Training error is when uh, I have, I've, come, I've, I've run all this, I have the right representation, hopefully I have the right similarity uh, measure, and I, I know I have the right uh, learning algorithm, uh, but I'm only able to uh, have accuracy of let's say 80%. I'm, I, I'm unable to, for 20% of all the data, I'm unable to classify them the right way. Uh, so this error is, is, the, uh, is a training error because uh, in this phase I'm training the uh, model and uh, let's say 80% is as much as uh, what I can do. The next phase is where I want to now do this, uh, run this model on unseen data and this is the test error, and often the test error is lower than the training error. And a lot of what you, what, you, what you mentioned is, if I cannot see the entire universe of data, then I am going to make uh, uh, mistakes. I, I, my error is going to be very dependent on how big of a universe my training uh, set of data that I see is, or how much I can actually compute, um, how, how many data points I can actually run my training uh, algorithm on. Uh, I don't. I might not have all the luxury to train on, let's say, a billion data points. Uh, even if I have the luxury to see them, maybe I don't have computational power to run my uh, training model on them. So let's say I, I only have, I can only pick uh, 10,000 of them. Uh, there are lots of smart, smart ways to pick the right uh, ones from these. Pick the right 10,000 points from the, from the billion points that I have. Uh, of course, my error is going to be much more when I train. So uh, there are problems with not including all the points or not seeing all the points during the training phase, and that reflects in how much error you, you suffer, uh, but it's part of uh, the problem. So what kind of difference would there be between like an anomaly versus just a, an error where you couldn't really sort out what it is? Or are, would they kind of be the same? Uh, like if you're doing like live thread analysis sure. and something comes in that you've never seen before, sure. 
would they would it be classified as both like a, an error and an no, and an anomaly? So uh, by error, I mean uh, let's say uh, so an error typically is defined as how many things I misclassified. So there is a there is some ground truth of uh, what each uh, packet is supposed to be. Let's say there are 10, 10 packets that come across the network. There is one that is malicious, one that is, uh, I'm not sure what that is. It might be a, um, uh, it might be a bad packet, but it's not done anything uh, terrible to your network. Uh, and eight other good packets. If I classify the malicious pack, and let's say my goal is to classify, pick out the sharp needles, things that are different, things that are outlier, anomalous, uh, different words for it. If that is my task, I better classify uh, eight as good and two as anomalous. Um, if my task is not to do malicious, let's say all I have to do is do things look different. Uh, do things look different from the rest. Uh, if I'm not able to tag the, uh, the, the two packets as, uh, as, as anomalous, um, if, I do, if I misclassify one, my error is 10%. Um, so, that is the error I'm talking about. It's, it's how many things you misclassify, how many, uh, uh, and, and the error can happen two ways. I can, I can misclassify, uh, uh, I can misclassify an anomalous packet as a, as a good packet. I can, I can also uh, misclassify a good packet as uh, an anomalous packet. So you would see a lot of people throw words around, uh, like, you know, we would reduce false positives. And what they say is we would reduce the number of uh, packets that are actually good which we accidentally told you were bad. Um, and uh, false positives in general are terrible because, you know, uh, it's end of the day, there's an analyst trying to sit and uh, see if there was an actual breach to the system. And if every single day I'm giving you 5,000 different packets to look at, there's no way you're going to go through all of them and uh, find out which were uh, actually the ones that were uh, malicious to the network. So uh, false negative is when uh, you do the other way. You, you, there is a, there is a, there is a, there is a malicious packet which you classified as bad. Uh, it's false negative. There is a good packet you classified as malicious becomes a false positive. Uh, you want to be able to keep the false negatives to zero. You don't want any packets to miss, uh, which is often the reason why you get more false positives. You're trying to push this boundary between how much false negatives I get to how much false positives I can get. So the more you go away from false negatives, because you want to be able to have zero false negatives you don't even if there's one attack I want to be able to not uh, be able to not capture them so I want to push towards false positives but the trick is to see where I can push back and say I don't want to uh, inundate the analyst with uh, tens of thousands of different alerts every single day right so it becomes critical depending on what the application is let's say my task is to automatically without the doctor look at a scan tell the patient if he has cancer I better not do false false negatives or even false positives in this case is terrible because uh, a patient can come after me and sue me for all the emotional trauma. So it depends on the final it's application. The medical. That's, the, that's the lesson here. Right. Yeah, yeah, don't 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 make uh, machine learning decisions with with medical data. I think I think a good analogy for that is like uh, capital punishment. Right. So right. Like we don't want to send a single innocent person to the chair. Right. Thing. We don't want anybody to die because we got it wrong. Right. So sometimes we're going to let somebody who's actually guilty go free. Right. Like that kind of thing. And it's like, yeah, we don't. Yeah, I shouldn't be making these decisions. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, so that, that, that is, that is yeah. very relevant because a lot of, so there, I was reading this recent uh, article that was written by Kathy O'Neill. She's a professor in law and a couple of other departments. Um, she wrote a book called uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. Uh, and so she talks about how machine learning algorithms have been used uh, prevalently and how if used incorrectly or how if interpreted incorrectly uh, can be quite destructible. And uh, some of the examples of where uh, learning algorithms have been used uh, recently are, uh, you know, uh, things where you want to decide whether or not someone should get a parole. Uh, fi finding the possibility of someone repeating a crime after he's, you know, he's gone out of jail. Uh, seeing if you can figure out if someone should get uh, uh, housing, fair housing. I'm going to collect a whole bunch of different, uh, um, different data from this person. 
and I know some of them should not get fair housing and some of them should, I'm going to uh, see if my machine learning algorithm can automatically uh, do this because there are way too many applications. So there are sensitive and critical tasks that machine learning is being applied for. Uh, and again, you know, the, the, the rationale between trying to do machine learning is if with my limited uh, knowledge as one person or even a group of weak uh, uh, knowledge together, if we can only do so much, uh, machines can look at a, a much larger uh, amount of data. Uh, it, it can learn from uh, past history, so why not run machine learning? So, uh, so Kathy's point is that um, if the question is not whether or not you should run machine learning, uh, if there is a chance to machine, run machine learning, you should run machine learning. But the question is, how uh, human sensitive are they? How critical are these uh, uh, for humans? Because at the end of the day, it's affecting someone's life. Uh, so uh, it, the trick is to see if there is uh, any, uh, if, if there's a problem with interf inferring the results. You know? uh, if there's a problem with um, presenting the data unfairly. Uh, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of recent work. Uh, my professor at the university, uh, he just got a grant today from the NSF. Uh, it, it's for uh, FAT machine learning. It's fairness, accuracy, or fairness, accountability, and transparency in machine learning. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, so I don't know if you remember a few months ago, uh, there was a uproar on Twitter because uh, there was a, uh, there was, there was this, um, there was this black, uh, coder whose girlfriend is also a programmer and uh, she posted a picture on Twitter saying uh, sh her boyfriend's picture was automatically tagged by uh, Google Images as a gorilla <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was a huge uproar and so uh, and, and, and people started posting all kind of different uh, uh, different things saying uh, algorithms are racist uh, machine learning uh, is racist and, and, and again you know uh, you know, we laugh at this, but uh, this might be a simple case of uh, let's rectify this problem. What uh, oh, I don't know if it was Google, maybe it was Facebook. Uh, they gave an uh, internship offer to both uh, of the couple, and you know, they, I think they went on to work uh, at Facebook or Google. But you know, it, this problem is e easily solved that way. But let's say my task is to see if uh, someone is going to go back to jail, and I collect a number of uh, data about them, and this actually is happening, in fact. Uh, and um, let's say someone, and, and it go, goes back to feature uh, selection, right? Let's say there are a number of dormant features that are inherently uh, biased. Uh, I'm not going to use the word racist because racism or racist could mean different things. Uh, let's stick to the word bias. Uh, bias could mean uh, multiple different things and bias could be inherently hidden inside the data that you collect and let's say you collect multiple data points about a person when you try to determine whether or not you should go to jail. Uh, that, and that becomes very tricky. It affects the life of, of a person. And uh, therefore, you know, you have to be careful in trying to see if there is a if, if there's a hidden bias in the data. And often the complaints about racism or uh, bias in machine learning algorithms uh, is not uh, is not actually the problem of the algorithm itself. It's the problem is that the data that you present is inherently biased or uh, uh, inherently not uh, neutral as you would think neutral should be. And therefore, uh, uh, it transfers to uh, the, final, uh, the, 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 uh, the final end result. And I'm going to keep talking about this because this is interesting. Uh, one of the examples that my professor gave uh, about how uh, he, he talked um, uh, at the Science Friday um, uh, show uh, yeah, with, the, with the radio station in Park City. Uh, it was about you know, you know, racism and uh, it, I think the topic was uh, can, can, can there be racism in, in machine learning algorithms automatically trying to figure out who should be hired? And a lot of companies do this uh, now. They let, um, they let the resumes pass through uh, automatic scanners and trying to pick um, which resumes to go pick at uh, and go look at. And there is some machine learning algorithms that try to, uh, that are in play. And so the question is, can machine learning algorithms be racist in trying to see who can be hired and who cannot be? 
so this was the topic, but the example that uh, my professor gave, I think, is a is a is an excellent one. Um, and it goes back to why the learning algorithms uh, inherently are not biased. It's the problem is how we present the data and how, what kind of uh, inherent biases are, uh, are are present inside the data, right? So uh, the example that he gave is um, uh, he has this he has this uh, you know uh, dish that he his grandma makes. Uh, it's it's amazing. Uh, she wrote it on a piece of paper, but uh, he loses the paper. Uh, he loses the recipe. So, but people have been coming over to his house. They've been eating his grandma's dish for uh, a number of years. So, and he vaguely remembers what the uh, ingredients are. So he's going to be. Uh, he wants to recreate uh, this dish by uh, trying multiple uh, different times. So he knows that it, it should have like five eggs, although he's not sure if it's five or 50. Um, and he knows there's some flour, he knows there's some sugar, uh, he knows there are, there are a few other things that are possibly missing. Uh, so he's going to try this multiple times. And think of these ingredients as your different uh, data items, and each time it's you know differently biased. And you want, the final task is to see if you can um, recreate grandma's uh, dish. And so he makes them every single time. People come over and taste. Sometimes they vomit. Sometimes they say, oh, it's not too bad. And finally, he's able to do it. He creates this perfect dish, um, which is a, he's very happy about. And let's say he's done this here. And he wants to do the same thing. Let's say he goes to China or India, and he wants to do the same thing, where people haven't really tasted this before. And um, the learning algorithm, in some sense, is the is the is the process of making it. Uh, the the partial data is the biased data. Um, the people's inference is when they tell you whether or not it tastes good. So there is no way you can expect uh, this whole process to settle down on this uh, final amazing grandma's dish with a completely different population in China who has never tasted grandma's dish before. Uh, it's got, and the taste differ, and it's, he's going to settle on some other final end result, which people say is amazing. So uh, the learning algorithm itself, in some sense, in most cases, are not uh, biased. It, your, your, your data is in, uh, could be inherently biased. The inference could be biased. Uh, the, uh, and people quickly jump to machine learning algorithms are racist. Let's not do machine learning. So anyway quick uh, deviation from the from the presentation you guys have any questions All right I'm gonna I'm gonna run through this because we haven't got to the meat of the topic uh, representations in in general uh, are, are are hard um, Xbox uh, Kinet for example um, I was at this uh, really good talk. Um, one of the vice presidents uh, at, at Kinet uh, team for the longest time. This was a project out of Microsoft Cambridge, and for the longest time, they wanted to be able to see uh, if they can um, if they can capture uh, uh, videos and be able to process uh, videos um, for the machine learning algorithm. Find out you know whether or not when I move, you know this is my hand, you know this is my leg, and so on. It turns out the the the, the chip on the on the Xbox uh, heats up way too much. If if video is the data that you that you provide, um, their learning algorithms were not able to successfully identify different body movements. So, end of the day, they said, okay, let's let's do away with uh, really really rich data. Let's 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 do really crude data. Let's capture a series of uh, images, and that's all we are going to process. We are going to process a series of images instead of a much richer video which we know is going to be very hard for uh, the limited processing power that uh, Xbox has to, uh, to, to run. Um, learning algorithms are not set to run that effectively with uh, that amount of data on a, on a smaller box. So a lot of times, it's not about having uh, very rich representations. It's about taking a step back and seeing, is this really what we want? Can, can I have a much simpler uh, uh, representation of the data, which uh, may solve my final goal. The final goal is to see if I can capture my human body movements as as quickly as possible. I don't want any s seeming lag when I I move my body and then uh, the 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 uh, character in the 
in the con uh, on the screen moves it a second later, then it becomes useless for the end user's experience. So it all depends on the final goal um, and what you want to achieve. Whether or not you should have, uh, you should you should seek more data, or you should step a, take a step back and go for uh, a limited amount of data that may solve the problem much better. And it turns out they had uh, multiple people uh, dressed up in uh, body suits with uh, these biomechanical uh, sensors, and they move around and they know yes, if my hand is here in uh, at one instant, if I capture a number of images and the the uh, the 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 time lag between the uh, different captures is small enough. I know that when my hand is here, it cannot be here. So they have, and they run a very, very simple 40-year-old machine learning algorithm called decision trees on top of uh, very crude um, biomechanic images and a series of pictures on them, on them, and that's how Kinet works. Very crude data, very uh, old algorithm, but it still works great. So the, the, the takeaway message is, you know, the right representations some somehow is very hard. It all depends on what the end goal is, and it's a it's it's a it's a it's a process that you have to go through. It's it's a loop. You you try different things. Things work. Sometimes things don't. And you go back and find dif different representations for the same data that you have. Uh, maybe that works better. So the takeaway here is uh, the the right representations are are critical for uh, comparing the data correctly. And again, if you cannot compare the data correctly, you, you're going to uh, classify them wrong, even if you have the best machine learning algorithm at hand. So I skipped out a few slides. Uh, I don't know if they're very interesting to you. But uh, here are some questions that are, that are practical when you want to do feature selection. Um, if you have the domain knowledge, it becomes very easy. If you understand some of the features, let's say in InfoSec, if you have, uh, in, in our case, let's say we have 4,000 features. And if, if there is a security expert who has seen uh, what bad packets look like, what good packets look like for tens of years, it's very easy for uh, he or she to sit down and say, uh, these, these features that we pick are not really relevant to finding the needle, so let's, let's do away with them. So if you have the domain knowledge, that becomes the first question. If you have the domain knowledge, prune and throw away uh, features that are not relevant. Um, if this, uh, one of the common uh, practices in machine learning uh, is, to, is to clean the data. And by cleaning, uh, what people commonly mean is trying to take the data and see if different features are are, are comparable. So there could be features that are uh, that have that lie in a range, let's say uh, zero to uh, one million, and there could be features that lie in a range zero to one. So um, clearly, they're they are not uh, they are not uh, commensurate. You, in general, for learning algorithms to be successful, you want different features to lie in similar ranges. So often people uh, would normalize the data to write uh, for each feature to lie in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in the same range. And often the same range becomes 0 to 1 because it's very interpretable for humans. Uh, and uh, this becomes very tricky. Although this is, a, uh, this is a hacky way of trying to clean the data. Cleaning the data, it turns out, is very, very critical for multiple competitions. You would see many people who win these uh, learning algorithm competitions. Uh, the people who win, uh, they most often, more often than not, do this. They clean the data through multiple different ways, and then they run ten or twenty different algorithms, and they find the consensus between these uh, different algorithms. Each algorithm has a has a. Uh, they they throw each data point uh, into a different bucket, and one simple way to find a consensus is to be able to do uh, simple voting. 20 uh, different algorithms that I ran, um, let's say 15 of them said this uh, instance should go into this bucket, I'm going to take that as a, as a majority vote. So that's one way to find a consensus opinion. There are other algorithms to find a consensus of multiple uh, learning algorithms. More often than not, the, things that, uh, the, the, the methods that win are finding the right uh, features 
cleaning the data uh, a lot and then just one of the shelf algorithms find a consensus between them it's never about let's in, let's uh, invent a new algorithm more often than not uh, more data and more domain knowledge beats better algorithms Right. Uh, uh, multiple other questions. Uh, I'm going to not go through all of them. I'll make the slides available for you if you need them. Um, I'm going to mention this a little bit. Uh, let's say my task is uh, going back to uh, image categorization. Let's say I have different uh, bins that I want to throw my images in. Uh, my data could be dirty in some sense. Uh, you c I could have things that are kind of outliers uh, that restrict how well my uh, clustering algorithm or my learning algorithm is going to perform when I want to be able to throw them in different categories. So often what people would do is to see if I can identify these outlier points and throw them away and then cluster the rest which gives you a, which might give me a much better uh, accuracy than what I could have if I if I had to run my labeling or run my uh, learning algorithm on all the data that I have. So in some sense, data might not be inherently uh, clusterable or uh, learnable, but if you throw away some of the data, uh, then often, more often than not, uh, you could get a much better classification uh, simply because uh, the data was dirty to start with. So uh, there's a number of feature extraction uh, methods. Um, uh, you know, if you if you download and play with any of the open source uh, machine learning toolkits, uh, you would find a number of these uh, being uh, the default uh, feature extraction or feature selection uh, tools. Uh, I'm not going to go through uh, all of them, but uh, these are useful in different scenarios. Uh, again, depends on what kind of data that you have, what learning. Uh, task that you want to run and often uh, even if the kind of data is the same um, the choice of the uh, feature extraction method depends on the final task the takeaway is that uh, uh, feature engineering is often an art it's it's it's, it's one of the hardest things to do uh, if you don't have the domain knowledge uh, or if you're not able to uh, look at the structures that are present inside the data. Uh, if my data is text or images, it's easy for us to look at. Uh, if it's not, and if it's in high dimensions, it's very hard for us to see what kind of structures are present inside the data, and therefore picking out the right features becomes very tricky. Uh, it, it, it's an art. You go through uh, cycles and see uh, what the right feature selection method is. So I'm going to go through some machine learning algorithms, um, uh, but I'm going to pause and see if you have any questions before that. Or rather, what would you like me to talk about? Uh, do you want more practical uh, insights, or do you want to know what kind of machine learning algorithms are there, or do you want to talk about um, other uh, pop culture applications? I'd like to know about the ones that exist, the learning algorithms. Okay. Any other takes? Right. Uh, yeah, I, I think that it'd be interesting to learn about the algorithms. If you want to go into application, I think it'd be really cool to uh, try to focus more on you know information security and pattern okay. analysis, that type of stuff. Okay. All right. Let me go uh, through them some some algorithms, and then we can discuss some applications in InfoSec. So uh, a lot of times you would see people say, uh, "My data is." normally distributed, 
Um, I'm going to use a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution in trying to capture the structures that are present inside the data. And the reason for this is um, actually because of uh, a really old theorem called central limit theorem, which says under some conditions, if you have a lot of data, and, uh, and I'm going to say, it, let's restrict this case to my data is numeric. Um, let's say this is uh, the uh, height of all the students in a class. And let's say my class, uh, for definition of a class, is all the fifth graders across the world. So I have sufficient amount of data. So if I have a sufficiently large amount of data, and if you plot them, uh, in general, the data, data is shaped in a bell curve, and this is very common. Uh, it doesn't matter what data you collect, uh, this property holds uh, across different data that you collect. So often people would uh, use um, what is a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution, which is a, which is a bell curve, uh, uh, to capture how similar things are. And um, when I talked about similarity measures, a Gaussian similarity then becomes the uh, becomes the go-to choice for uh, for practitioners in trying to see how similar uh, things are. And uh, um, uh, let's say you know different types of data. Uh, let's say in two dimensions, let's say height and weight of students in a class, and uh, you let's say we plot them uh, because. Two dimensions, it's easy to do. I'm going to do a scatter plot of the height and weight. And uh, these are different uh, types of shapes that I can have inside the data. Uh, the first one, uh, the variance is uneven. This is a much tighter cluster, and this is a much uh, spread out cluster. Uh, you could have unevenly sized blobs. Goes back to the um, problem of class imbalance you could have. This class having millions of points and the other classes having very few. And if I want to be able to find three clusters inside the data, uh, for most machine learning algorithms, it's going to be tricky because uh, all, all it sees is a very homogeneous group here. And this could easily be uh, misconstrued as outliers. And, uh, and this may or may not be the case uh, when uh, a human is asked for an opinion. A lot of cases, people might say that there are three different clusters here. Um, <coughs> If, uh, if this is not the universe of all the points that we have seen, there is a reasonable expectation that there, there could be more points here, and therefore, uh, the sparse group uh, is possible cluster. So um, a lot of times, a lot of algorithms might miss uh, those uh, sparse uh, set of points and uh, treat them as outliers, uh, or not. Sometimes it might classify them as one of the group, and uh, in, in, in the case that we actually expect them to uh, treat them as outliers. So it's very hard for the machine learning algorithm, unless and otherwise we manually annotate some of the points. For example, let's say here, in this case, uh, the sparse points to be outliers or not, it's very hard for the learning algorithm uh, to be able to uh, make a decision one way or other. Or you could have uh, incorrect number of groups. Um, let's say we only seen a partial collection of data, and it so happens that we didn't see some of the data points here. And it turns out they're not really two distinct blobs. It was just one uh, big cohesive group. Uh, I could, or may, the learning algorithm may or may not make a decision uh, that is suitable for the, for, the, for the ground truth. So in general, uh, even though I can identify uh, uh, shapes inside the data, and even though my data is in two dimensions, it's rather easy to do math on. It's uh, easy to do uh, visually inspect and see if my learning algorithm did correct. Learning algorithms still go through uh, uh, tons of problems, or uh, in the other case, they could be um, they could be skewed, and uh, a lot of learning algorithms don't find structures that are skewed. That are, that are skewed. Some of the learning algorithms, for example, k-means, for example, is a very popular clustering algorithm. It finds nice and uh, round shapes inside the data when given skewed structures, uh, which are homogeneous to human eyes. K means fails terribly. But other algorithms work uh, great uh, in that context. That the other algorithms which work great uh, with uh, weirdly shaped data may or may not work, work uh, good with uh, uh, nice and uh, Gaussian shaped data. Um, 
but uh, you know again it depends on you know uh, can I run the algorithm can I see the end result can I interpret it uh, if do I know if my learning algorithm has uh, done really well can I calculate how many false positives are there can I calculate how many false negative negatives are there where is the, where is my happy uh, balance between false negatives and false po false positives do I need a different algorithm or do I uh, merely need to change the knobs in my current algorithm. All this becomes this part, part of the uh, cycle that you go through uh, once you pick um, uh, what algorithm to run. Uh, so regression is a, a, a popular, uh, so I lied a little bit when I said uh, three, there are two types of broad types of machine learning algorithms. Um, supervised and uh, unsupervised. The third category is uh, called regression. Uh, with regression, you the, the goal is to see if you can find uh, trend lines in the data. So common applications include, can I predict the stock, stock market? Uh, you know, uh, can I estimate how many uh, people are going to uh, buy my product on my website, uh, given what happened over the last year? Uh, one of the things I was doing for Yahoo was to see if I can estimate the number of uh, uh, um, you know, the, the ad spots that we should sell uh, based on past uh, user uh, uh, traffic uh, to each different portal in the, in, the, in, the, in the website over the past year, past five years or so, um, how much, and, and correlate them with how much, uh, uh, how many how many advertisers, uh, you know, uh, come to Yahoo? Uh, so regression in general is to the task is to see if you can find, uh, uh, if you can fit a line through the data. And often the line uh, need not be a line. A line could be a squiggly line. A line could be a squiggly line in multiple dimensions. Uh, so it becomes harder and harder if, depending on how well you want to fit the line. So uh, you could you could do this. Uh, it fits it, the line. It fits through all the points perfectly, but it's terrible. Um, any guess why it's terrible? You can't really action on it. Right, and if there is a new point, it's very hard to extrapolate this information because uh, my lines are all over. Um, this is. Uh, a little bit reasonable because it's a it's a much more general line to uh, to to extrapolate for unseen data. So the the idea is to see if I can have a line or or I'm using the line word line very very loosely. Um, if I can fit a curve through the through the data points loosely enough that I can extrapolate it for unseen or future data. And um, again, there are multiple algorithms for regression. Some of them work well, some of them not. Um, there are things that are inherently unpredictable, like stock market. So I could run my best regression algorithm on them, but you know, uh, often stock market uh, is not about uh, just my past history. Number of future parameters come into pictures, therefore uh, predictions become tricky. But in the case that there are not, I want to do uh, future predictions, extrapolations for things that happen uh, uh, that are not outside factors. Regression works great and. Uh, numerous applications. The second category of uh, uh, of machine learning uh, is uh, is uh, supervised learning, and the supervision comes from uh, domain experts being able to tell uh, what is good or bad, uh, or being able to label, uh, for example, images uh, with different category um, uh, labels. Um, if we have the luxury of do that, always, always do uh, run supervised learning algorithms. Uh, the biggest problem in InfoSec, for example, is the ability to not have um, these labels. It's very hard for um, it's very hard for a practitioner uh, or even a uh, security expert of uh, of multiple years of experience to be able to look at a traffic packet and say if that that was uh, actually malicious or not. Uh, it could look different. It could be anomalous when we use the word anomalous uh, very loosely, but it's very, very hard for uh, uh, security experts to say uh, whether or not a particular traffic in, in the absence of other uh, context to, sit, 
to say whether or not this uh, uh, traffic from the list of uh, uh, attributes that we collect for the traffic um, as good or not, and uh, and and that becomes the that becomes the trickiest problem uh, because often supervised learning <laughs> algorithms vastly out outperform unsupervised uh, algorithms. Uh, we'll talk about unsupervised algorithms in a bit as a third category. In the case of unsupervised learning, there is no domain expert who, which, who tells you what is right and what is wrong, uh, or what if an instance should be labeled a particular way. In which case, the best you can hope for is to say, these uh, instances look similar. I'm going to put them in a similar bag. The other instances look similar. I'm going to put them in a different bag. Uh, and in general, supervised learning algorithms in vastly outperform uh, unsupervised learning methods. And the problem with running machine learning algorithms for um, information security, specifically looking at uh, the kind of data that we look at at Eastwind, uh, the network traffic data uh, becomes very tricky because there is no uh, there's no labels for us. Uh, so it's very hard to run supervised learning algorithms. Um, we don't even if we have labels, we don't have enough of them. Uh, these bad events don't happen often, um, and they definitely don't happen to every every single customer. Uh, uh, or at least they don't happen to every single customer in, in, in the time span that we can look at the data. Uh, so inherent, so end of the day, some everyone or someone is going to be breached. Uh, but uh, until, un, until un, unless we see bad uh, packets, it's very hard for humans to annotate them because we haven't seen them. So uh, machine learning um, for uh, network packets becomes very hard uh, in, in that sense. Well, so uh, I was I was at Black Hat uh, re uh, recently, and I was talking to a lot of different companies uh, which run machine learning, and a lot of endpoint uh, solutions uh, where they want to run machine learning, and they taught the word artificial intelligence, and uh, often you'd see a lot of marketing around. We are the AI for your endpoint. We are your new um, artificial intelligence for uh, your your. Uh, antivirus uh, products. It's a much easier problem there because there's a you know the, the task then becomes here's a file I have downloaded. Uh, the file interacts with my uh, system in multiple different ways. Um, it makes a, bu a bunch of memory calls. Uh, uh, it 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 either deleted or uh, added a bunch of fi files. There is a list of operations that a downloaded file uh, did. And now can I go back and say if this file is malicious or not. Uh, it's easy because uh, I can run supervised learning algorithms on them. Um, and this is because there are places like VirusTotal where you can go and say, hey, here's my MD5 hash of my, of my file. Uh, can you tell me if this was malicious or not? And, um, and since, they have, uh, uh, since they have a uh, you know, label from multiple different vendors, uh, there is a reinforced opinion on whether or not a file is uh, malicious, and I can run my uh, supervised learning um, algorithms on these already labeled uh, examples, already learned, uh, labeled instances, and they are not they are not just a few. There are uh, hundreds of thousands of malware examples out there. So if I want to build a machine learning classifier to identify uh, malicious malware from uh, regular uh, non-malicious files that are downloaded. It becomes a much easier task because simply because supervised learning algorithms in general outperform uh, algorithms that are unsupervised. So support vector machines are have been around for 15, 20 years, and uh, they are a classic example of uh, what a supervised learning algorithm is. So you have, let's say you have two cases, uh, two classes. I'm sorry. Uh, you have the squares and you have the circles. Uh, think of this as um, email classification, ham as a spam. And uh, let's say the task is to uh, find a separation between them. You want to be able to, you want to be able to uh, draw a, draw a line that separates uh, the two classes. And um, in general, there are multiple lines to draw. You could draw. A line uh, in the first case, second case, or th third case. Um, the decision to draw a line uh, then boils down to how uh, 
uh, far away you are from what is called a support vector. Uh, a support vector are a support vector is a point that is a data instance that is the closest to the line that we draw to separate them. Uh, they kind of support. They are the ve they are the vectors in the high dimensions that become supporting to the to the line. Hence the term support vectors. Um, I, we want to be able to keep a good margin between the support vectors and the lines, and they typically become uh, good margins to find a good separator. And support vector machine, there's uh, some um, uh, slightly complicated math uh, underneath it. It runs an optimization problem, but end of the day, given two uh, uh, sets of uh, uh, classes, all I have to do is draw a line or a curve in multiple dimensions that separates these two classes. And let's say there's a new point that comes in and it happens to be here. I'm going to, uh, my model is going to classify that as a square. And if it's going to be, if it happens to be here, it's, it's going to classify that as a circle. And after the point uh, of, of learning, I could run my learning for uh, across multiple days worth of data. But after I've constructed a machine learning model, all I have to do is, when I, when I see unseen data, to, all I have to do is to figure out which side of the, the line is my new unseen data. If it's, on, uh, if it's on this side, I'm going to classify that as a square. If it's on the other side, I'm going to classify that as a circle. Think of this as spam versus ham. Extends uh, to that analogy as well. Uh, sometimes, it's very hard for a, for a line to separate the data, so you know you want curves to separate data. Uh, there is a lot of math behind how to draw how, how to draw curves. Uh, there are curves are tricky, so you can transform the data into a space, but you can actually draw a line and still separate the data. Let's not go into that, but uh, there are ways to do it. Right, so uh, there are multiple types of classifier for uh, support vector machines. In case of a linear classifier, you have a line, linear. Um, you can have a Gaussian classifier, which is a differently shaped classifier. Uh, it could identify different shapes that are present inside the data. So your data doesn't have to be linearly separable all the time. It could be uh, separable via a, a, a squiggly curve in multiple dimensions. There are ways to do it. And uh, uh, there are multiple different classifiers. Um, nearest neighbors, linear SVM, uh, decision tree. Uh, these are different um, supervised learning algorithms. They try and identify different structures present inside the data, as you can see from the visualization. Each of them find different uh, regions to, um, to um, that it thinks the data is cohesive uh, inside of. Um, and each of them perform differently. So again, it depends on the user and, and, and the uh, interpretation of the results and uh, the data at hand uh, that determines which of these algorithms uh, is going to be successful. Might have run a lot over time. You're good. OK. Um, again, other examples. Uh, uh, at least in, in information security, you see a lot of people using uh, Bayesian learning as a, as a common marketing term. Uh, naive by Bayes is a, is a really old machine learning algorithm, uh, which uh, is what people call Bayesian learning uh, when they talk about uh, we have the best Bayesian learning algorithm that can do, uh, that can solve all the magic. I think a lot of problem in uh, people not believing machine learning is because um, it's being marketed way too aggressively, and uh, there are words and terms being thrown around and uh, used uh, indiscriminately that leads people to believe, uh, oh, this can solve everything for us. And in fact, it's a 50-year-old algorithm; it can only do so much. So, uh, so going back to you know, can machine learning do everything for me? Maybe not. But uh, should I try machine learning? Definitely yes. Um, should I be careful about how to interpret results of machine learning? Of course, uh, yeah, uh, is 
oh, the yeah. whole pipeline hard it is but you have to go through different cycles it's a it's an engineering experiment it's a yeah all machine learning is just a best guess right so, correct and because if you knew the exact answer you wouldn't need the machine learning right because right. if you could you could put in parameters that determine whether it was right. successful or not so machine learning is like we think this is what a match with right. our best guess right and and um it's funny, one of the uh, pioneers of deep learning algorithms, which is now very popular uh, over the last four or five months or so, uh, multiple deep learning companies, startup companies, uh, which are two years, hardly two years old, have been sold for a uh, few hundred million dollars to Apple, Google, uh, Intel, uh, Salesforce, uh, and all these companies had five or six people in them, uh, um, primarily because they could, they, they can run deep learning, and deep learning is hard, and people love deep learning these days. But a uh, couple of years ago, I was talking to one of the pioneers in deep learning. He was at Google then. He is now a chief scientist at uh, Baidu. Uh, he has multiple classes on machine learning and deep learning. Um, if you want, uh, you should definitely uh, look at those classes. His name is Andrew uh, Nick. He was a Stanford, he's a Stanford professor, uh, he has multiple tutorials on deep learning and other machine learning algorithms. Very, uh, very user friendly uh, notes. Uh, so he spent about two years on Google trying to look at all the YouTube vi videos and run them through deep learning uh, deep learning algorithms. There was no end uh, goal uh, in hand. Uh, all they wanted to see was they wanted to. See separate the uh, videos into two categories. They did not uh, do any supervision before. They did not tag any of the videos as you know, uh, bad singing or political rant or whatever. All they wanted to see is, I'm going to pass this through uh, a deep learning algorithm, see what it results in. And interestingly, it separated all the cat videos from the others. <laughs> After two years of running uh, <laughs> through multiple uh, multiple GPUs uh, and 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 and, and uh, uh, deep learning servers, um, hundreds of thousands of uh, YouTube videos, it, it was able to classify uh, cat videos from not. But it was never there was no supervision that uh, the there was no end goal uh, in sight. Um, the task was to simply see can I find two two different categories. Curiously enough, a lot of people watch and upload cat videos, and <laughs> it, could no. it could identify cat videos. So everything's either a cat video or, or not. not. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. end of the day, uh, the machine learning algorithm is going to give you a best guess of what it thinks it is. Um, so, uh, whether or not it's useful, uh, maybe uh, finding out uh, cat videos is very important to me because when maybe I come back from work and I really, really want to watch cat videos yeah, and you do not want to type cat videos because it's too much so it's I want YouTube to automatically recommend me cat videos one after other two years of deep learning could do that for me but <laughs> <laughs> or I could see if I can uh, figure out um, uh, well it could be useful if you didn't really you never want to see a cat video right 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 that too yeah, yeah. so uh, you know it depends on how much you really need something uh, to run uh, you know, it, it, when you have uh, this decision of should I run machine learning? But, uh, uh, I'm going to briefly go over this, give me two minutes, and I think I should be done. Uh, clustering is a popular type of uh, the third category where you have, you don't have the luxury. Um, it's like this cat video example. I did not label any of the uh, instances as uh, good or bad or one of the categories that I think it should go into. Uh, all because I don't have the domain expert, I don't have the time, I don't have the resources. Could be multiple multiple of these reasons. Uh, or simply that uh, you know bad instances don't happen very often. So in all the data that I've seen so far, there is no case of bad examples. So I don't have quite the labels for them. So all I can do is, can I find structures inside the data? and um, a lot of algorithms for clustering, a lot of them fail in um, different cases. A lot of them are successful in different cases. Um, for example, if I have nice group, um, nice circular groups, um, algorithms like k-means, they, they are good at finding them. 
but they are terrible at um, things that are uh, homogeneous but are concentric rings. Uh, they're not quite good at that. Uh, there are other algorithms that are that are good at finding them, um, uh, but they're not quite good at uh, classifying uh, 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 homogeneous uh, cohesive circular groups. So uh, here I'm able to visualize the data. It's in two dimensions. It becomes easy uh, as a, as a practitioner. I know k-means is good at finding these things. I know db scan is finding other uh, structures inside the data. But what if my data is in multiple dimensions, which is often the case, right? It, no one has two features to look at. Um, it's often hundreds of features, or if not thousands, uh, in which case I'm not quite able to visualize the data. So often it's a, it's a choice of let's run through multiple of these algorithms, uh, find which one does the best. Um, and uh, if I don't have any belief in any of the final results, uh, one of the common uh, approaches is can I run an ensemble of them? Can I uh, can I take a consensus of all the opinions that all these algorithms gave me, and maybe it's slightly better than the uh, individual uh, opinions? Let's skip over them. Oh. So, uh, tons of different examples, different applications uh, you can. You can, uh, from handwritten uh, digits, this is one of the classic examples from the 90s. Uh, for USPS, uh, people wanted to see if USPS can actually scan uh, all the addresses and um, sort them uh, automatically. Uh, and handwriting is crazy, so the task is to see if you can automatically figure out uh, each of the digits. Seemingly very easy problem, but uh, tricky because, you know, I don't know if this is a six or a, or a five. Um, as a human, I'm going to go with five because I'm used to writing uh, terribly. But uh, but this could be a six for in the eyes of uh, uh, machine learning algorithm. So neural networks was one of the popular uh, and successful attempts at trying to uh, put them in um, you know nine or ten different buckets. Um, Quick question. Yeah. Um, has any of this been done uh, to? Create some kind of tools to do capture analysis, or to solve captures using machine learning. Capture. Captures like <laughs> capture. On, uh, oh, capture. Uh, capture. Yeah, yeah. So, tons of work. Uh, captures have been uh, widely discredited with machine learning algorithms as well. Um, uh, while initially uh, captcha became popular, um, um, they were easily broken by running very simple and uh, common machine learning algorithms and trying to figure out what the images are uh, inside the CAPTCHA and then trying to break CAPTCHA. So uh, since then, I don't think CAPTCHA has been very popular. And interestingly, the, the group that released CAPTCHA was also the group that was uh, instrumental in trying to bring CAPTCHA down. Mm -hmm. um, spam as a SAM, classic example. Um, identifying faces and images. Um, very popular for a number of uh, applications. Uh, stock market prediction, uh, extracting market structures uh, inside the data. You look at different uh, historical code and you want to be able to see if uh, similar companies group together. It in fact happens. All the, all the oil companies are together. All the uh, large security companies are together. Tech companies are together on historical codes. So kind of they move together. Uh, uh, up or down. Uh, so I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, it's a Skikit-Learn is a very popular uh, Python library for for machine learning. It's very easy to install. A couple of minutes, very easy to play with. Uh, tons of examples uh, inside Skikit-Learn. Um, this is a nice cheat sheet on what should you do. Um, and uh, um, I'm going to give the slides, but uh, if you search for Ski Kit Learn uh, Algorithm Cheat Sheet, uh, this is like, I, I look at this every single day, actually. Uh, even though I've, I've been doing this for uh, several years, uh, I still like looking at this because uh, this is one of the best cheat sheets I've ever seen. And uh, uh, with this, oh, some takeaways, uh, correlation, 
doesn't imply causation. So a lot of times we, we want to find correlation inside the data, and we try to, as humans, try to interpret uh, causation from it. Might not always be the case. Learning algorithms are good at finding correlations, not quite causation. Um, in general, more data and uh, better labels beat uh, cleverer algorithms. Um, if you cannot do anything else, learn multiple models. Do not try one and um, throw them away. Learn multiple models. If you're not happy with any of the um, models, try an ensemble of them, uh, find a consensus opinion, and see if that is helpful. Yep. I use the death by capture because they can do recapture and everything. Do you have any tools you can recommend for machine learning for captures? I can. Um, I, I know I've looked at them a few years ago. I don't definitely don't remember. <laughs> um, if you can uh, give me a contact, I, I, I know where to look at. I can give you. Yeah, well, then do audio. Do, what's that? The ones I've been testing on the audio. So. Um. If they do the audio, then it's easier. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Flash recognition. Sure. Interesting. I, I I can definitely point you some. That uh, by capture, obviously, it's pretty cheap. And just as right. humans, they all solve it for you. Right. I'm just curious if you had anything top of your head. I know I I I looked at this capture stuff four or five years ago, but I, I definitely don't remember them right now. But. I said I was going to only plug my company once, but I was told to do this another time when I finished. If you want a free trial sensor uh, uh, to see what we can do for you, uh, go to eastfieldnetworks.com slash trial. Uh, it's a virtual sensor that you can download and install. Uh, play with it, see if you like it. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.